started building an ark. That's pretty awesome. Because the title of message is Make Yourself an Ark. And some of you children are probably tempted to do that. Have you ever tempted to do that in Sunday school or in school? Kind of a fun thing to do. And most of you probably have books about Noah and his ark. Raise your hand if you've got a book about Noah and his ark at home. A very familiar story, right, to most of us here, and maybe not to everyone. But Noah did something that you would wonder, how could he know to do it? Well, he knew to do it because God told him to. Let's look at that text, and it'll be up on the screen, and I'll read it. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. I know of a couple other people, and some of these events are still going on, were told by somebody else or they had it in their own mind and heart to do something extraordinary like Noah did. That took a very long time, many, many years. Korzak Zilkowski, how many of you know of him? He's the one that was put in charge to build Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse was an Indian chief who fought for the land of his people. Okay. He fought to keep, he just wanted to keep their land. He was killed by a bayonet of these Europeans that had come in to the land. But it was a Lakota chief, Standing Bull, who asked Korzak to build this monument, a tribute to him, as well as letting people know that moved here about the culture of Native Americans. That started in 1948 and it's still going on today. About the third generation of that family is continuing this work. Many of you, maybe some of you have seen it. have gone there different times to see how far that's gotten. But it's still in progress. 1948 till now. You can add up the years. Another person was a, studying for the priesthood in the early 1900s. His name was Father... Doberstein. And he was, became very ill with pneumonia, near death, while he was at the seminary. He made a vow that he would build a structure to honor God. And that is called the Grotto of the Redemption in West Bend, Iowa. Not too far from here. And it has been considered by those who have seen it as the Eighth Wonder of the world. It's worth $43 million. He spent 10 years gathering gems and other precious stones to build this structure. There's like eight different like stations uh, about Jesus' work on earth. If you ever haven't seen it, it's a day trip that you might want to go see. He did it because It's kind of like Luther when he was struck down by lightning. I'll become a monk, okay? And so Korzak was told by somebody. Noah was told by God. So people can do these extraordinary things. People can. After Noah, they did extraordinary things and stayed with it. As Noah stayed with it, with the help of his sons, to build this ark. Think of the words here in that text reverent fear. And one of my instructors says, it's not just like being awed at God. It's like, yes, he means what he says. His promises are always true. His promises are always true. He says, I'm going to give you this. He's going to give that to you. If he says, I'm going to end this, he will end it. He says he's going to bring the flood to remove every living thing from this earth to destroy it. He meant it. See, Noah had faith. 
He obeyed because of faith. Not just holy fear. He had faith in this God because he knew this was also a loving God. As someone once said, God is good, but he's not always safe. You need to be obedient. Because of that obedience, we need, he brought his son Jesus for us. Even before he created the world, he knew we would need a Savior that we would fail at obedience. And we look at Adam, or Noah, was he perfect? No, he was a human being. He was a sinner also. But he sought after God's heart. He sought after God's heart. And there's readings in First Peter and Second Peter that Noah spent a good amount of time, years, of trying to minister to the people around him. But how many people got into the boat? Eight. There were only his family. But yet, he proclaimed. He proclaimed. Some of the ministries that we do here with the neighbor to neighbor, the porch light, and now we're trying to start the toy library. These are ways to reach out. Are we, is that going to guarantee somebody's going to come here? Are they going to believe in Jesus? No. God just calls us to go out and plant the seeds. He'll do the work. But he says we are to do it. We don't always obey that, but he gives, gives us a take two, right? I think every day of the week he gives us a take two. Start over. Start over today. Start over today. Because we're among people almost every day. Most of us here, right? My youngest son doesn't talk to many people during the day. He's a street rod restorer and he's an artist doing that stuff all day. He doesn't talk too much. That's his nature. That's why he does that kind of work. Okay? But he still talks to some people. As we all do. Now, even God here, when he made this promise of sending a flood, he still gave the people 120 years. People will now live to be 120 years. There's 120 years like... That's the time when Noah did his preaching and continued to obey God. And in time to come, it doesn't say exactly when he did start building the ark, but he had his sons when he's around 500 years old. And they helped him build the ark. And the flood came when he was 600. That's a lot of time passing. Can you imagine the taunting that he got from the people around him? I don't know how close they were to him, but God was still populating the earth at that time because people lived for hundreds of years. That's how God perpetuated life on earth. But God came to the point of his take two. I'm going to start over. Noah became like the second Adam. I'm going to start over with his family. He's going to become the heir of righteousness. From this family, I will grow I'm never going to send a flood again. I'm never going to send a flood again. Do we trust that promise? Jacob, do we trust it? We trust the promise. It's not going to happen again like that. Now, we get floods around here, and I just saw some on the East Coast recently, that are, but not one that's going to destroy all living things on the earth. Never going to happen again. And he's going to come back, right? Is that a promise? It's a promise. See, that's a promise we hasn't been fulfilled yet. We see a lot of the fulfillment of prophecies in the New Testament that were made in the Old. But there's still promises we have to, we're waiting for, right? The end time's coming. But don't be afraid, afraid to read the book of Revelation, which gives you some more pictures. It's like pictures of those times. Sandy's sister is pretty interesting last Friday thinking about this message. See, Texas Sandy, take two. It's her second time, the second week in a row to go back for chemotherapy. The week before, her platelet count was too low. She said, take two. Didn't go back. This is for the last time to her last treatment. Okay? So that take two got done. All right? So she's looking up. Even though usually after chemo you're kind of down. But when you know it's the end of it, you, you feel better anyway. Just in your mind. 
So that's how God looked at starting human life again through Noah. Let's look at Genesis 7, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You think of all these years. God said, okay, you've done it. You've stuck with it. Now, how many of you children here have been given a job to do at home? And then after you finish that job, you're going to get a certain reward like carrots and broccoli. No, you weren't going to promise that, right? It's probably something sweet, right? Now, how many of you got that even though you didn't finish it? Does that happen, right? So even we as parents, we don't always follow through as we said. You don't follow through on the promise to not let you get it if you don't finish it, right? Are we tempted to do that as parents, right? And children, you're tempted not to finish it and fight against it. Okay? So God says, I give you a take two. Take two. And your parents give you children a take two. They're going to give you another chance. They're not going to kick you out of the house. Okay, can we build an ark? Well, Carla really got started with that very well. Very well in the children's sermon. When we gather around friends and you children... And the teachers here, you get to gather around some friends you haven't seen for a while and also people that aren't your friends that you don't know. And those others are typically people in need. You're going to find need, needy people in every school at Lincoln Lutheran as well as Lincoln High. There's going to be needy people there. Are you going to step out like Noah? Noah probably had to look like, ever hear the term, a sore thumb? Noah probably stuck out like a sore thumb, and he probably felt like it. Sometimes when you do things for others, other friends are going to say, what are you doing that for them for? Because, see, some of the lies of people around us are pretty messy. But God says, get into those messy lies. And you children have an opportunity in school to get involved in some people's messy lives. In Lutheran High School, I was at in Minnesota, we had peer support. High school students that made a commitment to talk with others, to reach out to others. But you don't have to be a member of a group. God calls us all to do that, to serve those around us. As a church here, this community here, we're building one another up in this church. This is an ark. But is this the only people God wants in this ark? In our ark here? Maybe he might be calling us to go out of this ark. Some of you that have been longtime members of a life group, maybe consider start a life group in the community where you live. Meet at your house. Around some food. Bring them together. That's one way of serving others. Because they most likely won't come here, but if you go to them and offer them something to eat, there's something around that. That's why we have food here all the time. Because that's community. It build, helps build community. Food and fellowship. Mark 16, 16 it says, He that believeth and is baptized will be saved. Everyone here baptized? When you were baptized, whose ark were you put into? Who claimed you? Jesus did. He put you into his ark. He adopted us. He didn't just put us into the ark. He told your parents, hey, I'm adopting your children. You're just going to be their caretakers now, parents. I've adopted them. That's awesome. And it can't be taken away. Even when we disobey. Even when we don't follow through with God's commands. 
He forgives us because of Jesus who covers us. We are righteous before God because Jesus covers us. God gives us a take two every day. Just like David. When David was caught in that grave sin by Nathan, did he argue back? Anybody? Did David argue back? And say, I didn't do that. Like we hear so much today. He says, oh my gosh, this is what I did. Wouldn't that be great? If a public person just confessed rather than fight back? But God will give them a take two if they repent of that sin. Believe and be baptized. He that believeth not is condemned. When we look at our people around us and our own families, extended families, the other people we want in the ark, we can bring them into community. We can bring them into our community, but we can't force them into God's ark. Just like Noah, we share the word, we witness. But we can't force them to get on the boat. Now, did Noah need this big a boat just for his family? No, God just gave him the directions to build this size of a structure of about one and a half football field length. Most of you know the length of a football field. And how that was made, it's hard to tell, but people have ingenuity. Pyramids and other things that were built by human beings before all the tools and technology. And God gave him that wherewithal. He wouldn't give him directions like that if he couldn't do it. And one last verse we'll take a look at here. Genesis 7, 5. Okay. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. He did it all. He thought he was righteous, and now a few verses later he says, You did it all. The animals are on the boat. You know, God had planned that all. I think the thousands that went on. And then there were many extra besides the pairs for food and sacrifices. Sacrifices. It's killing animals and burning it. After the flood also, in the Old Testament there were sacrifices. It's only a true sacrifice if blood was shed. So Noah had to deal with a lot on that boat and after he got off the boat. But he had faith. He obeyed God because he trusted Him that He was going to take him to heaven one day. Even though he lived hundreds of years more, beyond 600. He knew he was going to have eternal life. So he obeyed. Is that a good reason to obey? He's got eternal life planned for us. He says, go out there and take a risk. Talk to that person. Take a risk for me. Take a risk for me. Be reckless for me. Get dirty. Get into other people's messes. They might come to know Jesus as their Savior. 